Topic Notes Bony Fish Class Osteichthyes Most people, when they go in the water, either scuba diving or snorkeling, focus a lot on bony fish. And we're going to talk all about them today. The fish you're seeing here in this picture is a flounder. And it's a very unique fish in the fact that in its larval form, it actually is positioned very much and oriented very much like a normal fish would with an eye on both sides of its body. It actually metamorphoses as it grows, and one eye migrates to the uh, same side as the other eye, and becomes a very flat fish that lives on the bottom. And of course, we're going to be really focusing on form and function throughout this talk. So let's get started. So our main ideas today is that bony fish have evolved adaptations to a wide variety of habitats and play key ecological roles within the ocean. And again, make sure to keep track of your learning goals as they are in your learning scales and will be on assessments. So fish, along with chordates, are in a group called the craniata, which is very characteristic of having, of course, a skull uh, that surrounds a brain, olfactory organs, eyes, inner ears, basically all those sensory organs we associate with that. And the craniata are divided into two subphylums. The first subphylum is hyperodoretti, and this includes hagfish, which we'll get to in a minute. Then we have subphylum vertebrata, which you should be pretty familiar with because you're one of them. Uh, and of course here I've listed only the fish versions of vertebrata. Remember there are plenty of others like mammals. Today we're mostly going to be focusing on bony fish, but lampreys and cartilaginous fish go in here as well. So let's take a look. So here's that first group we're going to look at, the hagfish. And they're very interesting. They kind of look like eels. Their heads are supported by cartilaginous sort of frame. They don't really have vert vertebrae, um, but they do retain the notochord. They have ventrolateral slime glands, and here's where they really get kind of disgusting. They produce goops and goops and gobs of slime all over the place. You can actually just type in hagfish on YouTube and you can find all sorts of videos about this, but they're definitely kind of interesting that way. They generally live uh, buried in mud and feed on soft-bodied invertebrates. However, let's say a large whale dies and that carcass gets to the bottom. Hagfish will definitely be there to slither out and go into that body and start devouring whatever they can. They are very big on scavenging. So now we're going to move on to subphylum vertebrata, our own phylum, but of course we're going to look at something a little unique, lampreys. Lampreys are jawless fish as well, um, but they do have a vertebral column, and they are found in marine and freshwater regions. Their adult forms prey on fish. Um, they're actually, in a way, parasitic. They'll actually latch on to the fish, and the wound that they create, they'll actually use their salivary glands, which create like an anticoagulant, um, which stops the blood from clotting, and they're able to feed on the blood of the prey. Kind of very interesting. Um, the juveniles are often filter feeders. We actually have some problems with this up in the Great Lakes because uh, lampreys have gotten in uh, due to the opening of different channels from the ocean. And they're definitely having a negative impact on a lot of the fish populations in the Great Lakes. So now let's take a look at the evolution of jaws. So jaws evolved from the most anterior pair of pharyngeal gill arches. There are two living classes that are within this group that have jaws. Uh, first would be class chondrichthys, which we'll talk about in 10.2. This is cartilaginous fish, uh, such as sharks and rays. Then we have class osteichthys, which are your bony fish, and that's what we're going to talk primarily about today. This includes lobe fin fishes, uh, the coelacanth, which we're going to talk about, uh, ray fin fishes, which are, of course, most of the fish you know about. Lobed fin fishes have a characteristic muscular lobed fin, <laughs> and we also include lungfish in this category as well. Now, for many years, the coelacanth, which you see pictured here, was considered extinct. Uh, we had known about their fossils that dated back about 70 million years ago. However, it was in 1938 
that a living coelacanth was actually found off the waters of South Africa. The story of its discovery is actually really interesting. Um, it was from an African museum curator named Marjorie Courtney Latimer, and she was a female naturalist at a time where they weren't necessarily looked upon very well. And she brought the attention of this fish to the world, and it was really an amazing story. And if you're interested in it, I highly recommend a book called A Fish Caught in Time. Um, it's well worth the read. It is by Samantha Weinberg. Go check it out. Now, the coelacanth itself has not really changed much in, uh, over these millions of years. And in fact, looking at footage of them or in pictures of them kind of makes you think of what the oceans would have looked like when they were kind of the uh, rule, not the exception like today. Now let's take a look at ray fin fishes. Now ray fin fishes are generally the most common fish that you see out there if you're going snorkeling or diving, if you ever go fishing, or you look at fish in an aquarium, or even eat fish uh, if you like seafood. They lack muscular lobes. They tend to have swim bladders, but not always. Uh, they have fin rays, both spiny rays and soft rays. They have a bony skeleton, they have scales, and they have a perculum covers on their gills. Fish are very well known for having scales, and there are several different type of scales, and I'm not going to get into the in nitty gritties of them, but they are for a few things. First of all, they're overlapping, and their arrangement adds to their flexibility, and they help to streamline the fish and make them a little bit faster in the water, and of course protect them. The other thing that they have along their skin are glands that secrete mucus. And if you've ever touched a fish or handled it, you probably notice that it tends to feel a little slimy, and that's why. Now this slime both reduces drag and it helps support the fish's immune system. And that's one of the reasons why when we go out and we do any seine net collections, things like that, and we're uh, taking fish up, I generally always have students use cups and bowls to to scoop up the fish instead of their hands. Because the more you rub your hands on the fish, the more you rub off that slime coat, and that could leave them open to possible um, problems health-wise later on. Now we'll look at the lateral line. Now this is a series of tiny sensory pits along the side of the fish. And usually in some fish like the snook, you can definitely see the line. Uh, others, you have to look a little closely. But the cool thing about it is the neuromasts inside the, these little sensory pits sense changes in water pressure. Um, so if there's a moving object nearby, this fish will actually pick the vibrations of the pressure changes caused by that moving object. This allows the fish to do a few things. First of all, if you ever see schooling, like shoaling uh, activities, this is usually done through using lateral lines to help orient each other to their positions in the water. They can also detect predators and possible dangers and prey items, obviously if they're going after prey, using the lateral line as well. Now fish have a closed circulatory system. They have a two-chambered heart. Uh, and one of the things that I like to talk about here, uh, without getting in too much of the nitty-gritty of the circulatory system, is the fact that gills provide a very high efficiency for gas exchange in a water environment, in an aqueous environment. Water actually only has about 2.5% of the dissolved oxygen that air has in it, uh, which is one of the reasons why lungs don't work well underwater. Uh, there's a couple of reasons, of course. First of all, uh, it's hard to exchange enough volume of water in and out of lungs because we have a lot of dead space and we don't fully even exchange air as we breathe. So that's one issue. And then, of course, you add on to that the low percent of oxygen compared to air. Um, that also adds to the problem. The moral of the story, of course, is that gills function very well in water and allow fish to go through respiratory processes very effectively and efficiently. Now in the circulatory system, we can talk about countercurrent exchange. And we mentioned this in marine mammals as well, but in that particular instance, that is dealing with thermoregulation. 
here we're talking about the flow of blood compared to the flow of water. So in our non-example on the left, you'll see that the water, which is the blue arrow, is flowing in the same direction as the blood, the kind of pinkish arrow. And if you look at the percentages, the highest concentrated oxygen water is hitting the lowest concentrated oxygen blood. And so you have a general diffusion into the blood as you continue along. But as those percentages start to max out, they start to max out around 40-50% saturation in the blood. Now if you reverse the flow and basically have the incoming oxygenated water traveling in an opposite direction than the blood, this is what we're talking about with countercurrent exchange. And the example of that is on the right side. Here, the lower oxygenated blood is actually hitting the lower oxygenated water, but there's still a differential between them. There's still a gradient. So you still have diffusion into the blood. And as you move up towards the higher end of the saturation for the blood, you're able to fully load the blood as much as possible. This is why gills are so efficient. Now, gills can function in two different ways. You can have the muscular pumping mechanism that occurs with the gill covers, the operculums, or you can have what we call ram ventilation. Now, with ram ventilation, the fish generally swims forward with its mouth open, allowing the water to come in the mouth and out the gills, thus flushing the gills with water. So both you can definitely see in the, in the marine environment, Generally, it's the open water pelagic fish that tend to use ram ventilation, whereas more of the kind of benthic fish or the coastal regional fish where they're not swimming all the time are going to use that pumping of the gills to be able to create the water flow. Now let's look at buoyancy. Now, most fish with no other adaptation for it would literally just sink to the bottom. Uh, so they want to have methods to maintain buoyancy in the water so that they can actually thrive at various different levels within the ocean. Now some of these options are relatively simple, like swimming forward. If you're just the momentum of swimming straight forward, it gives them a certain amount of lift so they stay up in the water. Other options include the storage of low density compounds. So oils, for example, tend to be less dense than the surrounding water. So if they actually have a lot of oils, sharks do this actually, we'll talk a little bit more about this later, um, but it helps give them some buoyancy. Also the reduction of heavy tissues or bones. And if you've ever seen fish skeletons, like the one in this picture, uh, you'll notice that their bones are very thin. Um, they reduce them a lot to reduce that density and weight so that they help keep themselves up in the water. And of course, most people associate fish with having some sort of a swim bladder or an air bladder. Um, these bladders are generally filled with nitrogen or oxygen gas, and it's added through diffusion from the blood vessels around it. Uh, and these uh, bladders are useful for fish in maintaining certain buoyancies. However, um, if a fish is brought up from a deep level, maybe you know, 100 feet down or so, brought up to the surface really quick, you can overexpand that bladder as the pressure decreases and thus uh, causing it to rupture out of the fish, usually out of the mouth or the anus. The issue of pressure is also one of the problems with uh, air bladders when you go deeper. So if you start to go thousands of feet down in the water, most of the fish down there actually lack swim bladders, uh, so they don't have to deal with this gas issue and the pressure. Now let's get into one of my favorite parts, fish form and function. So we're going to look at body shape and tail shapes and kind of try and connect them to the types of fish that actually use them in their different environments and their different habitats. So first up is the fusiform body shape. Now this shape is more like a torpedo sort of uh, angular shape, and it's really for those high speed fish that are gonna be swimming all the time. It's very energy efficient, it reduces drag, um, and it allows these fish to just keep on going with minimal energy put in. Next we have compressiform, and in this shape you have a much more slender fish and these are great for basically being able to maneuver around reef structures or coastal regions. A lot of fish have this. Uh, they still are quite 
quick and swift, not as swift as fusiform, uh, but they're really still able to pick up some speed and make turns a lot better than a fusiform fish would be. Next up we have depressiform, and this is a very flattened body shape, characteristic of flounders, for example, that allows them to really blend in and work towards the bottom of the benthic sediments. Then we have globiform, and this is where you have this big round globular sort of shape. Um, these are usually bottom dwellers. Um, they're not going to be very quick moving, uh, but they are going to be maneuverable and they're going to be good in the benthos. Anguliform tends to be your eel-like form, kind of ribbon-like forms, and so they're very slender and, well, eel-like. Now let's turn our attention to fin shape. Now this sort of goes hand in hand with the body shape. For example, the lunate tail, which is the tail on the far right there on the bottom, is very powerful forward force, but it reduces the chance of turbulence. And so it's very energy efficient and very good for constant swimmers. So if you combine that lunate tail with a fusiform body shape, you're talking about a, a fish that can really go at speed for long distances almost all day long with a, a minimum of energy being, being put into the process. Then we kind of go backwards from there. A fork tail, again, is designed for nice constant swimming. Um, the deeper the fork, the faster the fish. Um, but combined with various different levels of compressive form to fusiform shapes, you're going to have different fish with different abilities in terms of speed, uh, maneuverability, things like that. Now, when you get into the rounded or truncated tails, uh, these are the kind of burst of speed powerhouse tails. They're going to move a lot of water. It's going to take a lot of energy, but they can have bursts of speed. Now, one of the last tails we'll talk about is the heterocircle tail. Now, this is typical of sharks, where you have uh, the upper lobe of the caudal fin that's much larger than the lower lobe. This helps do a few things. It helps to provide downward thrust when the shark is actually swimming forward, and thus uh, helping to you know, help with its buoyancy, basically. Uh, so this is not something we typically see with most fish, but it is something we'll see in sharks. So we'll talk about it again a little bit later in another note set. The non-differentiated would be sort of the tails of eels that just taper down to nothing. Now, in terms of reproduction, we're going to harken back to some of the information we talked about earlier in the year, specifically R and K strategists. Now, fish generally represent R strategists for reproduction, which means they tend to have lots of offspring, and most of those offspring tend to die. Uh, they don't have any real parental you know, care for them, things like that. This is contrasting to K strategists, which mammals tend to be. And K strategists, of course, have a few offspring, but take a lot of care and, and making sure they survive. So those are the two different strategies. And so fish tend to be that are strategist. Uh, they are quantity, not quality. <laughs> Hopefully a few of them will survive uh, to adulthood and reproduce. There are two, well, there's a couple more than this, but I'm going to focus on two different reproductive strategies here, the pelagic broadcast spawners and the benthic egg laying. So pelagic broadcast spawning tends to occur in a lot of, well, pelagic fish that are out there swimming in the ocean. In this case, they release egg and sperm into the water and there's external fertilization. Um, and there can be some actual uh, courtship behaviors that go along with this. It can just be a mass letting it really just depends on the situation and the species we're talking about. Now, as we turn to benthic egg laying, um, this is where fish uh, that uh, basically are usually associated with the bottom will lay eggs on the surface and sometimes guard them for periods of time. Now, if you've watched Finding Nemo, uh, they showed you this at the beginning of the movie with Merlin and Coral guarding the, uh, the nest of eggs. Now let's look at a local example. The picture on the bottom left there shows a uh, you know, yellow and black striped fish called a sergeant major. And this is a male sergeant major and he basically goes through this process of finding uh, a bare patch of rock and cleans it all off and advertises for a female. When a female decides she likes a nest, she'll actually go to that, that patch of rock and lay her eggs. The male will then come right behind her and fertilize those eggs. Now, once that process is finished, the female will swim off into big blue, never to be seen again. She doesn't really have any part of parental care. The male, however, will stay and guard the nest and chase 
everything that wants to eat the eggs away, as much as he can at least. And after a while, once those eggs hatch, he's done with his duties, and he will swim off and leave the fry, the little tiny larval fish, all on their own to flow into the water currents and take their chances. Now, in their larval forms, a lot of fish are part of the planktonic community, and they will literally flow in the water uh, and the currents to different destinations, but eventually they'll metamorphose into their adult forms and start growing up. Now, this is also where we're going to hearken back to some of the content we dealt with in first term. If you look at the various different coastal habitats, like estuaries, which include things like mangroves and seagrasses and oyster beds, these are all great places for larval fish to settle out and metamorphose into their juvenile forms and eventually grow up. That's why we call estuaries nursery grounds. Near shore reefs function in very much the same way, uh, as well as several other different habitats. So that's really one good reason why we want to preserve and protect some of these coastal habitats to allow these fish to grow up because a lot of these species will then move out into open water as adult forms to be part of those adult populations. All right, now I'll turn it over to you. Here's your in-depth question for today. How does coastal development affect fish populations. All right, that's enough for me. So until next time, keep thinking.